So in the depths of our heart, I think everyone has more or less the desire for truth. You know, we look for, we want to know the, the, the answers to things. Now, now the desire for, for that truth, I think that varies in people, but I think everyone does more or less want to know the truth. That's why we look things up. That's why people, that's why Google and Siri and all these things are so popular, because we want to know the answers to things. We look things up. Uh, so very often in a conversation now when someone mentions something, the phones come out and there's a little fact check going on to see was it really Spurs that won the Premiership in 1972. Um, it wasn't, apparently. Uh, so, you know, but as soon as someone's, you know, I'll check that, check that now. And, you know, things like Wikipedia, unfortunately, being so popular. And that it shows like people are, are they're, they're looking for answers. They're looking for solutions they're looking for to draw from the experience of others and the the, the lives of others the wisdom of others uh, the difficulty arises in two fields one uh, how f how deep that desire for truth goes and the second field which i'll mention immediately is if that is is a field of morality then it becomes uh, very very different indeed number one so uh, how how deep our desire for, for truth goes Generally speaking, I would, I would argue that today's desire for truth is actually quite shallow. That we look for headlines, we look for like short articles, I and mean, even like there's a whole psychology around this today now that people's attention span is so much shorter just because our, our information feeds are so quick. It's a headline, a paragraph maybe. So even if, if, there's, if there's a long article written about something, chances are nobody will read it. There was even, a, I remember reading an article, it was written by a, a psychologist and uh, he said, he, he warned at the beginning, uh, he said, this article is 2,000 words long. Statistically, most people will have stopped reading by 300. So then, as, he go, as, as you're reading through the article, he said, we've just hit the 400 mark, are you still with us? And then we just hit the 1,200 word mark, are you still with us? Because, like, and he was given the stats, by now, 80% of people have stopped reading. Now, I, if I'm honest, it was pretty hard to read it to the end. Uh, but it was the point being that we just don't have the attention span that we used to, whereas before, uh, Certain people, people who, who, had, who could, had the luxury, we'll say, of being philosophers, because again, in order to do that, kind of like being an artist today, if you were a philosopher back then, you didn't eat unless you were rich, because uh, you don't make money being a philosopher, just like you don't make money being an artist, isn't that right? Uh, so, like, so there's only, only, only the wealthy uh, could, could afford the time to be philosophers, but the ancient Greeks and that, they would try to delve into the knowledge of, of the day in order to understand who, who are we? You know, who, who are we in this world, relative to the world, who are we? Anthropology, you know, the study of man. And what, what makes us us? What makes me me? If I kind of look similar to my brother, am I my, a copy of my brother? Or what makes me an individual? What makes anything anything? <laughs> what is a chair? What, make, what is chairness? You know, all these things, uh, sort of looking into the, the essence and the substance of things and all of these uh, wonderful things which we will not go into because you're falling asleep already. So, um, so St. Justin the Martyr was a philosopher of the first into the second, well, sorry, he was born in the year 100, so into the second century. And he had a hunger for the truth. Similar to St. Augustine, uh, they, they had a hunger for truth, studying the philosophy of, of, of their days, uh, but... Ultimately, not discovering, just, there was something lacking, there was something missing. Uh, St. Justin grew up as a, as a pagan, so he, he, he wasn't born into a Christian family at all. Uh, but discovered the, the faith fair, late enough in the day for his, for his era, when he was about 30. Uh, discovered the faith and embraced it wholeheartedly. Saw this as, especially the words like Jesus, the way, the truth and the life. This just really struck him. Jesus, the truth, the truth. So all truth we find in him. Now again, we're not talking about you know, science and maths, although in, in, in a way they do reveal the, the, the beauty and the intelligence, the order of the creator, but that's not what we're talking about here. Like if we, if we follow Jesus, suddenly we understand microbiology. That, that's not it, obviously. But, but Jesus is the truth in, in all of the things that matter. Because Jesus reveals God to us. Jesus, who is God, reveals God to man and reveals man to himself. So St. Justin uh, embraced this faith with, with all of his heart. 
and then with all of his philosophical background, was able to argue it in the terms of the day that people would understand. Now, second century, uh, Roman Empire still f strong and still persecuting Christians. There were still violent persecutions of the Christians going on. So Justin decided to write to the emperor, a dangerous thing to do, but explaining who we Christians are and what we believe, and that we as Christians are actually no threat to the Roman Empire at all. In fact, because we believe that everything we do is seen by a just God, then even if we're not caught by the authorities, I'm still subject to justice, divine justice, which is going to make me a better citizen. Because then it's not about if I get caught or not by the police, by the army, whoever it is. I believe that I'm, I'm seen always by God. And we're not aiming to start a kind of a separate empire or we're not interested in property and money. Our kingdom is, is a kingdom of the heart. It's a, it's a kingdom of God. It's not a kingdom of, with walls around it. So we're no threat to the Roman Empire. <clears throat> so he wrote this and wrote a, a, a second, as it's called, a, a apology. It, it translates very badly. A, a apology, <clears throat> is, it's, it should be really translated a defense of the faith because he's not apologizing for anything. Uh, he's uh, describing our faith and defending it. <clears throat> and in one of his writings, he says, On the day called Sunday, there is a gathering together in the place of all who live in a given city or rural district. The memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Do you notice that bit there? As long as time permits. Yeah, we like that. As long as time permits. Uh, when the reader ceases, the president, in a discourse, admonishes and urges the imitation of these good things. Next, we all rise together and send up our prayers. When we cease from our prayers, bread is presented and wine and water. The president, in the same manner, sends up prayers and thanksgiving according to his ability, and the people sing out their assent, saying, uh, saying the Amen. A distribution and participation of the elements for which thanks <coughs> has been given is made to each person, and to those who are not present, they are sent by deacons. So it's a description of the Holy Mass. That's back from <coughs> midway through the second century. The very same thing that we do today. <coughs> so this hunger for truth, this desire for truth, once we have found it, though, once it has been revealed to us, once this treasure has been given to us, I don't want to say it comes <clears throat> with strings attached, but it comes with a certain responsibility. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt becomes tasteless, what can make it salty again? It is good for nothing. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hilltop cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp to put it under a tub. They put it on the lampstand where it shines for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine in the sight of men. This can be difficult, especially for, for us guys. When it comes to living the faith, generally speaking today, the way the faith is lived, it's so private, it's so personal, that on a football field, in a pub, on a factory floor, in a staff room, it may not be evident who's practicing and who isn't at all because it's either, either Christians or Catholics are, are intimidated uh, by some other vocal members of some, some of their peers uh, or maybe not well formed enough in their own faith to actually say, this is, this is what I believe and why. This is my faith and I stand by it. This, I have a real living relationship with, with, with Jesus and it's my greatest treasure. It's the most important thing to me. More important than a retirement package or more important than popularity or more important than my HD brows. Whatever, I, I just, my relationship with the Lord, it's everything. It's everything. It's everything to me. So there is a search for truth today. Personally, I think there will be a, a revolutionary rediscovery of the truth in time. I think this revolution will also probably be led by young people 
who have discovered the Lord and have, haven't all that the, the, the baggage of, of, of the past, but have a living relationship with the Lord who, who they know, who they love, and who they have discovered, in the, in, similar to St. Justin, as the way, the truth, and the life. So we ask the good Lord today, through the prayers and intercession of St. Justin, to help us to rediscover the truth of our faith and to live it and testify to it to those who see us. In the same way, your light must shine in the sight of men so that seeing your good works, they may give the praise to your Father in heaven. Amen.